All right, it's 8.30, we're gonna get started. Here. We have an agenda, it's pretty long, so um, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, the June public safety meeting, Madam Clerk will be in uh, compliance with open meeting law. Yes. We have a meeting that agenda that's been presented. Um, one thing I'm gonna do, and uh, I'm just doing it under my own discretion. We had a loss this week from a member of our community. And so I'd like to have a moment of reflection as we reflect on the life and contributions of Deputy Welch. So let's take a moment to do that. All right, thank you. Um, public comments. Who is here from the public who wishes to address the committee? Raise your hand. One, two, three, okay. Um, public comments, it's three minutes. You get to address the committee on whatever issue that you wish to bring up that's not on the agenda. Um, I'm aware that you handed out a document to the committee members and so, Mr. Schleter, I don't know if you got that yet. No, he didn't. Pass this down to him. Um, because it's not on the agenda, I'm going to put it on the agenda for next month. So we'll definitely invite everybody back to participate in a full discussion of what you're asking for the, for the committee to consider. Okay? So I'm going to go with, can you say your, say your name? Bill Slaysner. Bill Slaysner. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Close I'm enough. First, yeah. <laughs> I'll get Schlender, so no one ever gets that right. right. Paul Ward. Paul Ward, I'm going to have you go second. Third, Miss? Sam. Yeah. Sands, I'm going to have you go third. So, uh, Bill. Bill, you're up. Well, I've been asked to present to you and the county board a resolution to make Sawyer County a um, sanctuary county for owning firearms. And the reason for that is there's been a lot of talk recently to reduce the ability to have guns, own guns. And county, the county here gets a lot of money from guns because of hunting, sales, uh, it's a big sport. And it's a sport that anyone can do, whether you're healthy, you got poor health, or you're large or small, you don't have to be a big stock doll or you can be a small person, anyone, even people in wheelchairs can enjoy this sport. And we feel it's important for that reason. Plus, it is a big deterrent for anyone else to come and destroy us. I don't know, during World War II, Japan was going to invade the U.S. And one of the generals said it won't work because the general public has gone and they did not invade the U.S. like they intended to. So I think it's very important. It's also a way to provide food on the table if you need it. So I think the Second Amendment is very important to our country. And I think I'd like to see the county make sure that it stays that way. Thank you. Mr. Ward. Um, I'd just like to say what my background is. I was in the service and I was a military policeman. After I got out, I worked for the railroad as a policeman. And then uh, after that, I uh, was a Chicago policeman for 30 years. So what I'd like to say is what we're presenting to you today is nothing new. It's the rights and privileges that we have already. We're not asking them or petitioning for anything extra or more than what's the law right now. Um, I know sometimes you have to have a little time to digest the document that you were given or the exhibit or whatever, but um, that's all we're asking for, nothing additional. It, it applies to everyone. Law enforcement, you'll see it applies to, you see that it applies to the everyday citizen the hunter, the sportsman. Uh, so it's nothing additional. It's already law. We just don't want anything taken away 
because of whatever viewpoint might be uh, looked at, you know. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Ms. Sands. On January 13th of this year, my granddaughter was crossing the highway to get on the bus and she was almost hit struck by a vehicle. The vehicle came up on the bus and to avoid her ending the bus, swerved, picked up speed, got in front of the bus, spun completely around and landed in the ditch. And that is when we noticed that the granddaughter was taken off the bus at that time. And I would just like to know what is the procedure for this kind of incident? Because not only did she put my granddaughter in jeopardy, there was kids on the bus. My eight-year-old grandson had seen this. My daughter and I stand at the end of the driveway. And we have seen this and we could have been because of her carelessness. And also, her cell phone was not taken. She was not given a drug alcohol test at that time. And I just wonder why. And when asked if he wanted my statement, he said no, because he got it all off the dispatch. And I asked him again, and he says, no, I got it off the dispatch. So I just like to know what the procedure is. Because what they did to Gerald Bird should have been happening to my granddaughter, so they handled it. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on now to the minutes from the previous meeting. Has the committee seen the minutes that were presented? Ms. Dennis? Motion to approve. I have a motion by Ms. Dennis. Second. A second from Mr. Buckholz. Uh, in discussion, is there any amendment or any changes to the minutes? Hearing none, a call for the question. All in favor of approving the minutes as presented, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Moving on now to a proclamation honoring the life and efforts of Mike Sanchez. This is a proclamation that's for discussion and possible action. Um, if it's all right with the committee, we're going to read the proclamation. Want to read it? No. All right, this is a proclamation honoring the life and efforts of Michael Sanchez for his leadership and contribution to Surrey County. Whereas Michael Sanchez, a resident of, of the winter community located in Surrey County, Wisconsin, having lived in Surrey County for the past 29 years after serving in the United States Navy, the National Guard, and the United States Naval Reserve, and whereas Mr. Sanchez served the Surrey County community in various aspects as a law enforcement officer, a county deputy, and an investigator working with Surrey County Sheriff's Department and the Lacoudere Police Department. And whereas Mr. Sanchez developed the Surrey County Search and Rescue Response Team with his wife, Patricia Sanchez. And whereas together, Mr. and Mrs. Sanchez devoted countless volunteer time and effort training and developing an excellent search and rescue team that have saved lives and provided a safe and secure community. And whereas Mr. Sanchez retired from law enforcement functions after 17 years, but maintained his role as a Surrey County Search and Rescue Coordinator. And whereas Michael Sanchez passed away on February 23rd, 2020, after a brief illness, he is survived by his wife and Surrey County Search and Rescue partner, Patricia, daughter, Marissa, son Michael, four grandchildren, Michaela, Devin, Radar, and Skyler, and a great granddaughter, Maria. Now therefore it is hereby proclaimed by the Surrey County Board of Supervisors, Michael Sanchez's con contributions to our communities, our country, and to our county is an example of inspirational leadership and a proud example of our law enforcement community. His contributions in developing our Surrey County search and rescue team will be a reminder, will be our reminder of his love for his family and his community for the years to come. And be it further proclaimed, Michael Sanchez will always be a respected member of our community. The Surrey County supervisors on behalf of the citizens of Surrey County want to acknowledge Michael Sanchez and his family for his dedication and service. Entertain a motion. Mr. Buckholz. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, I entertain a motion to the proclamation for uh, Michael Sanchez for his um, benefits and gifts for Sawyer County. Second. Second by Ms. Dennis. Uh, in discussion, uh, you're asking for this to be forwarded to the full board for um, approval by the Sawyer County Board? Yes. Any other discussion on the matter? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. I just want to thank you for your time and your effort. And uh, I know this is a difficult and emotional time, but thank you for coming in. Thank you. Yeah, we actually should get a bigger copy. All right, moving on to number eight on the agenda. This is second courtroom options, discussion and possible action. All right, everybody has in front of them, committee members have in front of them this packet right here, which is the recommendations that come from Mr. Kane. Mr. Hoff, are you on the call with us? Hello? Hello, are you, are you, are you here? He's here. Okay. We have Mr. Kane with us. Mr. Hoff, you're on the you're on you're on the spot. You want to walk us through the presentation that we have? John is here. All right. So what we have in front of us are I think it was what nine options about the courtroom the potential for a courtroom expansion. And so um we have a number of people here that want to discuss this thing. We also have our, our board chair present as well. So, uh, um, Mr. Kane, can you hear me? And we love technology. Mr. Hoff, can you hear me? Well, what we're here today is to discuss and from this committee make a recommendation to the county board on the options. You want to pass it down to Mr. Schleter? Mr. Schleter, you don't, I'm assuming you don't have your copy. All right, well, um, we should try again. For who? Um, we've unmuted everybody. Mr. King, can you hear me? Mr. Hoff, can you hear me? All right, so. I think he dropped off, actually. Well, as the chair, I guess I'll have to moderate this discussion. Um, in front of you is the recommendations for uh, the courtroom expansion. The county board received a preliminary discussion point from Mr. Kane, who is the one who made these recommendations. They're numbered one through eight or one through nine as different options and venues. The, uh, the different components have the area that would be renovated or remodeled or built. There is also a estimated cost component that goes with that. And then there's also a displacement number, <coughs> which has also been attached um, that impacts the number of employees. And then there's also for two of the options, um, the number of parking spots that have been, that are gonna be impacted. And so what we need is uh, a discussion. So Mr. Hoff, if you're prepared, if you wanna, take us away on this discussion. I think what we're gonna to try to do is come with a recommendation as much as we can from the different committee members and have a chance to discuss this because I think we're trying to come to some kind of resolution on this so that we can have clear guidance either for the county board or for Mr. Hoff to take responsibility for the construction of the second courtroom. Mr. Chairman, can I say something before Mr. Hoff starts? I, I thought we at the last county board meeting we set it up that Mr. Keene was supposed to go through 
teams here and, and, and rate them from one through whatever. Uh, because a lot of these, like 7A, 7A, 7B, 8A, 8B, were kind of out of the question. So, and I didn't see where we received any of that. Well, the thing I would offer in response to that is um, we kind of know what, I think each of us have an idea of what we want to do. And we're, we're supposed to come up with the recommendation of what we'd like to have done. And so um, that's where I think we're going to go with that. Mr. Sh Mr. Schumer. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, you're correct, Mr. Buckle. We have requested uh, John Kane, Venture Architects, and Market Johnson, the construction company, to review these plans and come to us with a prior prioritizing list um, as far as ease of construction, um, people that would be displaced, parking spaces displaced. And they did come back with some um, some of their comments and rated them. And Mr. Hawk has that list. Have you shared that with the supervisors yet, Tom? Uh, I thought it was attached, but not. OK. Yeah, I had technical di that. difficulties. I We're all having technical difficulties. <laughs> they did, they did those, so okay. one through six. Because I've been looking for them on my iPad and I haven't seen them. But I've All right, them. Mr. Kane is on the line too, so he can uh, describe. But we do have uh, that document that Mr. Kane uh, sent that uh, goes through the the buildability uh, rankings for you. So this is John Kane. Are you able to hear me now? Hi, John. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Some technical difficulties. I apologize. I've been listening to the conversation, but I had to re-enter the invite so you'd be able to hear me. So I sincerely apologize for that. Mr. Kane, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, we've been given a charge from the last committee meeting. As you know, you've been talking about it to look at the constructability of the various options. And I believe you have in front of you a, uh, a document that um, we developed with assistance from Market and Johnson. Do you have that we don't document? We in front of us right now. Oh, okay. Uh, I apologize for that. I did forward a copy on to Tom. Is Tom on the call? Yep, I'm here. I'm just trying to pull it up now. Okay, thank you. So as I was saying, this document that Tom will share with you um, speaks exclusively to the constructability of the options. It does not address functionality. It does not address cost. I think both those are topics for consideration. Um, if you think of a matrix where you have each of the options and you list, rank them based on cost, functionality, as well as constructability. Um, that's this conversation we're going to have this morning. So, Tom, when you have that available, um, I'd like to go through that. Does the okay. committee also have the handout that identifies or describes each of the options? Do you have that in front of you? It's on the website. If you go to the Sawyer County website, the front page, it's on the top on the screen. Oops. Yeah, we have it on the screen now, John. Okay. And before we Can go, you go... Further, Mr. Kane, I, I need to interrupt you for a second. Can you, for the purpose of this committee, define what constructability means, functionality means, and I think we can understand what fiscal means. Okay. Um, Op functionality or operational ability, however you want to describe it, talks about how the courts, their associated departments, as well as the other departments in the courthouse would function and interact with each other, how the, how the public gains access to the building, how they work, uh, accessibility to the departments, ability to find those departments, Various departments work together in concert with each other. Certainly the clerk of court and their relationship with the courts 
is essential. Uh, the proximity of the courts together, I think it becomes uh, an important consideration. The ability to find the courtrooms um, in, in, in this campus, um, all of those things um, address the issue of, of functionality. Is that an understood definition? Yeah, Any questions on, on that? Go on to constructability. Constructability deals principally with the relationship of the new construction to the existing building. And I would say in a very simple, very simplistic way that, and I think it could be easily understood um, that a building that has no direct impact on the existing courthouse, its constructability is probably going to be much better than an option where we're building partway in the building and putting an addition onto that building or whether we're going into like option number six where we're going in and doing complete remodeling or gutting. Um, so I think you will see in the rankings that it's in many ways driven by its impact on the existing building. We also know that the building, the roof line, um, with its over, overhangs um, poses something of a challenge when one tries to build up against it. It's certainly going to change the roof line of those areas of the building that would be impacted by the uh, court's addition. Um, so that's, I think, as Market and Johnson and I looked at these options, that's kind of what we were thinking about in terms of constructability. Um, likewise, you'll see there's some comments about the impact of the construction phase on daily operations in the courthouse. Um, there will be some disruption, uh, certainly on any project, but um, depending upon where the construction might take place and the extent of that construction is to some degree going to impact the daily operations of the of the um, of the courthouse and those departments that have to remain uh, functioning during that period of time. Any questions or thoughts on that definition? Any questions from the committee members? No. Any questions from anybody else in the at this meeting or on the, on the call? <coughs> Who do we have on the call? Um, <clears throat> Well, if you've got other questions uh, regarding the, the buildability, I think um, we've had some discussions with staff as well since uh, the last time we met. So we've met with John Kane. He did provide uh, some documentation that is on the screen now that uh, should have been in your packets. Um, and we've had some discussions with uh, the court being uh, Judge Yackel, uh, March Kelsey, uh, district attorney, as far as um, operational needs for the court. Uh, we've had discussions with all of the staff affected by um, the different options um, as far as uh, operational for the other areas of uh, the county that would be affected by some of the options that were listed uh, in the final report, you know, the additional options that you had. So I think what it came down to uh, from the staff perspective, um, you know, option number two, which built uh, the courtroom off of uh, you know, this area extending into the parking lot was an option that, that uh, was very favorable for not only staff, but uh, also Mr. Kane on his uh, um, recommendations as far as uh, build, buildability. Um, the other option I think that uh, uh, has some weight is uh, using the area by the uh, deeds, treasurer, um, clerk, county clerk <coughs> office, um, that keeps the court situation all on that end of the building um, for the um, inmate transfer activity. Um, so those two options, I think, kind of rose to the top as far as um, where the court is most efficient and uh, that sort of thing. So I think, you know, the other options were a little bit more troublesome. That is like using this courtyard, there's all the power for the building comes in here. So that was problematic uh, moving uh, the court, uh, like in an area of the health and human services is probably uh, the easiest because it's a lot of space, but it's also the most cumbersome as far as moving people. 
So that wasn't really a, a good option from my perspective. So when we looked at all the options that were presented to you, it, it boiled down to, you know, do you want to take part of the parking lot or not? If you, you know, agree that, uh, you know, people can park elsewhere, you know, we could, um, have employee parking like behind the maintenance garage. We've got off street parking all around the building. Um, it certainly um, takes some parking spot out of our, our parking lot, but it, there, are, there is parking available around the building. Um, it's probably the least disruptive as far as the court. You've got to remember that when you build this building, you know, we still have to have court in the courtroom. And so, you know, all the noise and construction action that, that's going to take place. Um, you know, it will be disruptive for the courts as well as the rest of the, the activity within the courthouse. So um, it's something to bear in mind as well. So those were kind of the options I think that kind of rose to the top as far as uh, staff perspective and uh, Mr. Kane's uh, analysis. Should we go through the, the handout, Tom? I have, I have one question, Mr. Chairman. Good. Good. So what I would ask from this committee, as my public safety committee with the sheriff president, the judge, the jailers, and all these fine folks, is that we look at, we try to look at the functionality of these options. And Mr. Kane had ranked uh, scheme two as the constructability top option. So if we could look at some of these that he's ranked pretty high as far as functionality, flow of inmates, um, how the judge feels, the sheriff, the jailers, that would carry a lot of weight to the full county board. So we're definitely trying to get to that. I'm trying to figure out, is, is Mr. Van Etten on the line? Yes. All right. Chuck, can you hear us? I can. There was a lot of right. difficulty, but I am here. Okay. Ms. Dennis. You mentioned two plans. Being two, and what was the other one? That we're seeing? Uh, the other one was kind of a, a hybrid of, you know, you saw in your in your information in the final report um, using the area uh, in the clerk's feeds, treasurer's area, uh, but then where, where do we put that staff? There was also a plan where um, it extended like across from zoning and land records um, in that lawn space uh, there. Uh, that option uh, instead of being used for a courtroom, could be used to move a register of deeds, treasurer, and uh, those functions. So then you've got a hallway where the county functions are in one hallway. So you've got deeds uh, and treasurer and, and clerk on one side, you've got zoning and land records on the other side. So that hallway is kind of the county functions. And then the, the hallway out here is court. So you've got both courts and inmates all on one end of the building, county functions on the other side. So it kind of was a hybrid of, of those kind of options. Uh, it does require, you know, a little bit of moving um, for staff. You, so we would have to build that first, move them in there, and then remodel that area for the court. Um, so um, those were the two things that we were kind of looking at favorably. Ms. Dennis? Team two, we don't have to move anyone. Correct. Okay, I've gone back and looked at these, all of these. And I guess for me, I, I like scheme two, and it's up to the other one to be. Mr. Buckholz. Um, looking at scheme one and two, um, there's not a whole lot of difference in them other than scheme one, you would be saving seven parking spots. Um, so that would be, my uh, pick because of saving seven parking spots. But I would be also okay with scheme two. Mr. Sweeter? Do you have any discussion? <laughs> Mr. Van Etten? I like both one and two, if that's what, you know, it's coming down to. And then if it's in parking, you know, it just makes more sense got to have places to park for people to attend. Your Honor, <clears throat> you wish to address the committee? Sure. Um, from my perspective, uh, in talking with Tom, and uh, it's scheme two that uh, has risen to the top from my uh, perspective. 
Obviously, if money were not an issue and we were looking for the future, uh, scheme three would be the most uh, detailed and would be the most functional, but obviously that is probably what triple the cost too. So if you take that one out of the uh, running, it's scheme two in my mind. What that gives us is that gives us a, you know, it, this might not be a, 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 an important issue to some. I mean, you balance it with the seven parking spots, but if you block out those windows in the, uh, in the current courtroom, uh, that, that does create kind of a, a dreary effect. Um, is that important? I don't know. Um, but I am concerned uh, with Tom, uh, when, you, when I was talking with him about when they're constructing this about, you know, how long it's going to take and how, what kind of disruption it is, if it's separate from right up against the wall of the, of the current courtroom, that uh, would, would certainly be a, a welcome distance just from the construction noise and things like that. So um, I know, it, I mean, so you got to balance that, those things out. If, if seven parking spots are more important uh, than, than, than that, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's, that's everyone's personal choice here. But I guess I got to push back a little bit on the court system. So I would say two is mine. I've looked at that from the standpoint of transporting the prisoners uh, across the street, the inmates. And I don't think that there's going to be uh, any... I mean, there's not going to be any, it's not ideal the way we're doing it now, but there's not going to be any added complications, I don't believe, uh, from, from doing that. It, it, the court system will be, the second courtroom would be equal distance basically from the jail as it currently is. And then we're talking about building some kind of holding uh, cell over there so that it could uh, serve both courtrooms. Um, I think that would be very, very welcome and functional as well. But uh, for me, it's two. Madam Clerk, we're discussing courtroom and options. Do you have anything you wish to add? No, I agree with number two. Sure. I agree with number two. I think functionality on our behalf is, is probably best suited for two. I mean, three would be the best, but I think that's cost. Three is the best, but two is what's your recommendation? Yeah. Lieutenant? I agree with the sheriff, like three would be best, but it's not financially feasible, so two would be my next choice. All right, I'm not going to skip you, but I do need to go to the, the board chair. Oh, no. You two have me, I, I concur. Same here, I concur on that. Uh, our concern was inmate movement, some of those plans were, you know, moving the inmates to public hallway. So if, it, if movement was the concern, right? So three is the better option because it, it attaches to the jail, correct? Three, so for sec a security three, component- Three would be the best option, but- Schumann. Parking. Tom, we put some discussion together on parking and can you share your thoughts with where we're gonna put the spaces that we would lose with either of these options? And then kind of address where the staff parks now and we want to reserve these spots for people that are visiting and using the courthouse. Certainly, yeah. I mean, staff does park in the parking lot. Um, they, they don't have to, uh, you know, especially if we're going to lose parking spots, we could reserve, you know, the, uh, what lots or spots left are for the people visiting. Um, so staff could park on the street parking. Uh, we've also got parking like behind the maintenance garage. You know, it is, a, bit of a effort to get there, especially in the winter, uh, slippery and all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I, I think it would be preferable to have the people coming into the courthouse uh, have reserved parking and they can come and go, you know, maybe, you know, two hour parking or hour parking in the parking lot um, for the spaces that are left. So, you know, we've got parking on the street on, on all sides of the building. Um, so, I, you know, we lose parking spots in the parking lot. That's, that's true, but there is parking around. Anybody else? Ms. Sanchez, do you have anything you wish to add? Mr. Colson, what about you? We can work with anything, but two, we can get it all hooked up with the network and make it work. So if three was put on the table, how does that impact your functionality for your internet? Because is there broadband over there? Is there fiber optic over there? Um, we have we're fortunate in Hayward, there's 
the several providers for internet, uh, high speed internet would not be a problem in any location. Uh, one thing about parking too, if, if three was on the table um, as an option, you've, you've got parking issues there as well because um, you know the city is planning on putting a road behind you know like uh, the senior resource center extending back behind where the ambulance garage is. Um, so the senior center, uh, they lose some parking. Um, there's not a lot of parking for the court activity you know if, if number three is situated over there. Um, something to keep in mind as well. so. So Lieutenant Johnson, if we have option number two that gets put in place, what is the protocol or what would be the recommendation from the jail of transporting uh, inmates or incarcerated members from the jail to the, to the court? It really wouldn't change a whole lot from what it is right now, Mr. Chairman. It, it, currently we bring them basically out the lobby and, and across. Um, this would change it to ideally they probably would be coming from the booking room since the door would be on that end of the jail, but it'd still be walking across the street. Anybody else with comments on this? So this is discussion and possible action. Mr. Kane, is there anything else you wish to add to the discussion? Um, not really. I appreciate um, all the comments and thoughts. I've taken some notes. I wasn't able to hear every single person, but um, um, I'm grateful for the comments um, and uh, understanding that uh, it not related to the cost, that there are a lot of benefits, constructability and functionality related to option two. All right, so uh, Ms. Dennis? We haven't heard from you. About me? I, I think option number three is the, is the better option. I think that it's difficult because um, the financial aspects are, are daunting, but I think about the discussions that must have happened when they were thinking about building both the jail and when they're building this building about what it was to try to save as much money and then get the most out of their dollars. And whatever we build now, we're leaving for our children and our grandchildren to one, pay for it, but two, also have the, the functionality that work with that. My concern is the safety of, of the jail for both the, the people who are incarcerated, but also for the jailers who are responsible for the transporting of the, of the of people back and forth. There's always, the more exposure that we have, the more element of danger that's involved. And that's more that of responsibility we put on, on our law enforcement to do that. So I think we should be thinking about is, is saving, you know, $5 million, is that really worth the safety that's gonna happen if there's an incident? And is that dollar worth, you know, saving that, you know, versus, you know, the, the consequence that comes from that? Um, if, if it's the, if the, if, the, if the committee and the board feels that that investment is, is such that, um, you know, that's not tenable and that's, and that's fair. I mean, that's, we're asking taxpayers to pay for this then I would probably side with number two as, uh, as a viable alternative. Um, I'm concerned about the parking because I don't want to take away the parking from the people who benefit that and then promise it to people who are not here. You know, I don't want the second judge, if we ever get one, to be promised a parking spot at the sacrifice of the people who park here. You know, Visitors and dignitaries should have an opportunity and we always make accommodation for people who come to visit us. But I mean, you know, I think that we need to think about what the functionality of this is gonna be. And we need to think about this, not just for right now, but we have to think about this in the future. I mean, we got a jail that needs upgrades and some other things that's gonna happen going forward. And we have a constitutional responsibility to provide for that, so. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to Mr. Trebney, and then after that, um, I'm going to go to the DA. So, does anybody put any viability to option two versus option three? How long is the viability for option two? Is going to take from today to the last five, 10, 15, 20 years before you go to option three, or have to go to a different option? Has there been any Good viability question. done on that? Have you done on that? Well, I think the, uh, I mean, option two. Um, 
puts the courts together um, just like three would. So uh, the only concern I think is, is the prisoner transport across the street, which we've done you know, since the beginning of time. So option three does provide that. Um, and yeah, long-term, you know, is three uh, better? I, you know, the other thing is the jail, uh, expanding the jail. Um, I think that takes, I forget how the, the pods work over there. Do um, you have any comments on, you know, if you need to expand the jail, does that affect that if, if we go with option three? Depending on what options we have for that, it might. Um, I think originally the building was designed to be built up, correct? Yeah. But now I don't know if that's possible if everything that's on the roof or probably be very expensive. Um, you know, with climate control coming up, that's adding more things that are being put on the roof of the building. Um, so yes, option three would probably hinder at least that type of addition to the jail. Mr. Poquet, can you hear us? I heard a gasp. Mr. Boquette, if you can hear us, this is your opportunity to address uh, the committee regarding your recommendations or your, your discussion points on the expansion of this courthouse. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can hear you. There isn't a whole lot that I could ask, add. Everything that's been said, I pretty much agree with. I, I think that option three obviously is ideal. If that's not going to occur because of costs, then option two would be the correct choice. Uh, I think that will work for our needs. Uh, I agree with you and I think some other comments about there's not many counties that are left that have transfer where you walk somebody across the street. Uh, and I think that is because of liability and danger to the officers. But again, I understand all the factors that you guys are considering at this point, And I think that you're making uh, appropriate arguments and hopefully reaching a uh, very good decision. I, I think option two is where you're going to end up, but uh, that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Any other any other comments for the committee? I do. Mr. Buckholz. I'd like to ask uh, Lieutenant Johnson, um, what 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 are happening? What kind of troubles are you having now? I mean, for we've been doing this for years, walking them prisoners across the street. How much problem is that? I mean, do you have problems with them trying to get away or? or fighting with the, with the deputies or what? Well, it, it presents a danger for both the deputy that's escorting the inmate and the inmate. Um, you know, the high profile case, whatever in the past, we have transported inmates over by squad car and pulled right up to the door. Um, you know, that creates issues with timelines for court and depending on what else is going on. But it's everything from icy conditions to, you know, we have inmates coming out and, and we have, they have basically kind of I guess foam Crocs that they're wearing, um, you know, and then bringing them across for for court. It's just a it's a dangerous thing, you know. It always has been a danger. We try to accommodate as best we can, but with the number of cases that we're getting, the severity of the cases that we're getting, it, it's the danger just keeps increasing. Not to say the traffic, right? Yeah, I know I've come by there many times and I've seen you guys bringing them across. Yeah. I guess I'm, my thought was just wondering, you know, we've been doing it for years and years and all that we're talking about getting a different building or building added on and all of a sudden it's getting to be a big problem. Um, I guess I, 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 I'm still for number two. So can I entertain a motion to approve number two? You can hold on for one second. Judge? The only thing I would add to Lieutenant uh, Johnson is that I know that some of the uh, um, transport officers have uh, indicated that they've had problems with when they are taking somebody from court back to the jail. Family members will come out of the courthouse and talk with them as they walk them back. And I would just hate to ever have a situation in the future where you know, you're, something could happen. I mean, you're just exposing somebody who is in the protection of the county and that could potentially uh, be, I guess, catastrophic, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's the odd, nothing's happened really seriously up until this point. I remember years ago, there was somebody that ran out and ran out into the swamp after they took the shackles off and now they're shackled the entire time. Uh, so, so them running away isn't really a, a, a possibility, but, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's unsafe. 
Ms. Dennis? Does walking them across the street hinder the time for their trial or whatever? I'm told, I was told not long ago that it takes time to go get them, bring them over. Meanwhile, you're sitting there. Generally speaking, we have been, we've had run into problems with that, but in the last year or two, uh, the flow from the jail uh, has, we haven't really run into that. They've been doing a great job of, of getting them over. And then when, if, you know, when we're waiting for them, we're doing other things. So there hasn't been a lot of a problem with that as far as the flow goes. How a second courtroom is going to affect that, make it better, make it worse, I'm not sure. Okay, and sure. you have a problem parking elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Sure. I'll just add to that that the one thing about shuffling inmates across also increases our staffing needs because there's times we have to have that second jailer taken care of for the next one in due order. So it does lead to our staffing needs. Any other comments? Mr. Uh, all right, I'm going to go with Lieutenant Johnson, then Mr. Buckholz. I, I will just add piggybacking on what the sheriff said that, that currently it does require a law enforcement certified armed deputy to mm -hmm. bring inmates back and forth for their safety and for the inmate safety. If it was all connected like that and they were not leaving, depending on how that hallway, I guess in this case, was set up down to a holding cell, unarmed floor staff would be able to escort inmates down since they're not leaving a secure facility to get to the holding cell, which could definitely you know, make it more efficient time wise. I know the judge said there hasn't been a lot of issues until now, but from our end, it's been going. I'm just thinking for a future. Yep. Mr. Buckles. Yeah, well, but listening to everybody here, and I'm like, you know, we picked, went through one and two. Now it seems like plan three is getting put on top of the hill. Um, I don't believe that the county can afford plan three. I mean, that. Uh, I don't know if there's that much danger out there or not. I really don't know, um, but I don't want to see the county be liable for something, but I can't see spending that kind of money to move everything across the street. So before I go to Ms. Dennis, Mr. Schumann, what are you looking for from this committee and what is the end result of this discussion? Because we're going to have, we can talk about this until we're right. done, but what, it, what well, end result really, are you looking I for? I really want a recommendation from this committee on which option you prefer functionality, constructability. So this committee would carry, as I said earlier, carry a lot of weight to the county. Okay. Ms. Dennis? If we have some high profile cases, it's not a problem to bring them by vehicle to the door. If it's not, that's what the current is. Okay, so that is probably where problems would happen, correct? If they were walked across, anticipated problems, but you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, they could happen with yeah at any time. It, it it has always been a danger. It just this is at least since I've worked in Sawyer County, this is the first opportunity I'm aware of to have the possibility of doing something different than what we're doing. Okay, okay, thank you. The, the concern, the concern of a high-profile case is obviously safety but it's the concern of the jurors seeing the individual in custody and so what we have to do is we have to make sure that the jurors are uh put in a in a secure area where they can be watched while they do the transport so they don't look out um or if he's being brought in the morning they have to do it either really early in the morning or they have to put up they put up screens before so they drive up um, in that open area and then they put the screens up and then they get them out of the car into the holding cell. So with option two, that. that would still be. I mean, I think with option two, we would still have some very similar procedures as with that. Okay. All right. Before we do anything else, is there any other discussion from anybody? Buck Holtz, you want to continue with your motion? I do, Mr. Chairman. What is your motion? I make my uh, motion to approve plan number two. Is there a second? Ms. Dennis? All right, we have a second uh, in discussion. Is there any discussion on the motion, which is an approval recommend or it's a recommendation from this committee to the full board that we recommend option number two. Mr. Van Etten, do you have anything you wish to add? I do not. Mr. Sleater, do you have anything you wish to add? 
All right. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we're dealing with the public health ordinance enforcement discussion and possible action. In front of you- Chair, this is John Kane. Are you, are you finished with me? Well, you're done for today. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank so you very much. Bye, you Bye everyone. Part <laughs> Bye. You have in front of Thank you. All right. On the agenda now is some documents that have been forwarded for a public health ordinance enforcement. Um, we're going to put this up for discussion. It's kind of like a first reading. So even though it says possible action, what I really want is just to have a discussion on what this is so that we can fully inform our county administrator um, as to what we're trying to accomplish here. So Mr. Hoff, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got our uh, legal counsel, Rebecca Roker on the line as well, and she can ad address uh, more eloquently uh, what is before you. Um, with the uh, recent Supreme Court case, um, with the uh, stay at home order, safer at home order um, that came down, it did shed some light on how we handle um, uh, public health officer, local public health officer uh, order. So uh, our local public health officer, uh, Julia Lyons, has statutory authority to issue orders. Um, that's different than uh, what the state, you know, uh, Palm uh, had that got rescinded. So uh, our health officer does have statutory authority that's a little bit different than that. So the, what's before you is uh, an ordinance that kind of clarifies those statutory uh, obligations and authority. And I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Roker who can uh, describe the ordinance that's in front of you and why we are contemplating it. Rebecca, are you on the line? I am. The floor, the floor is yours. Thank you all. <clears throat> um, as Tom indicated, uh, you have, Sawyer County currently has a um, public health ordinance in place. So the first task was for us to review that existing ordinance and determine whether it complies with the uh, recent Supreme Court decision in um, the legislature versus Secretary Palm. Um, as I'm sure you've heard, that case uh, is challenging to say the least, um, in that uh, there are a lot of legal principles that are um, very unique. And from the county's perspective, one of the greatest challenges is determining the extent to which that the court's uh, holdings and rationale apply to the county. Um, at WCA, we have taken a conservative approach um, and essentially interpreted that case um, that with the understanding that a local health officer, in Sawyer County's case, Julia Lyons, um, would not have greater statutory authority than Secretary Palm. Um, even though the case did not specifically address what the public health officers, um, uh, how it, the public health officers were impacted by that decision, again, I think it's appropriate to um, construe the applicability of that decision um, in such a way that the public, a county public health officer does not have greater authority than the secretary of the Department of Health. So what does that all mean? Um, again, the Sawyer County currently has its public health ordinance. And in light of all of those legal issues from the Palm decision, what changes need to be made to your existing ordinance in order to A, comply with um, the new legal principles set forth in the Palm decision, but also importantly, to comply with the policy goals of what the county would like to see in terms of the um, enforceability of orders, um, you know, the extent of the public health officer's powers um, and so forth. Now, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, this is, it's been a, a challenging task to take the current state of the law and overlay it on your existing ordinance. Um, and so a lot of counties are 
experiencing the same challenges. So while we did an initial draft of revisions to Sawyer County's um, existing ordinance, um, after much discussion and much analysis and, you know, my taking this back to my team at Von Bereesen and having further discussions, we decided that it's probably best for Sawyer County to wait until the county's association engages in um, a study group that is going to really do a deep dive into these issues. And then Sawyer County can benefit from that WCA work. And then what we'll do is take that, um, all of that work and all of that analysis that the county's association completes, and we'll bring it back and do an overlay onto Sawyer County's ordinance. So while you do have this draft revision in front of you, um, I would advise that you hold off on taking action until WCA does its uh, committee study work. And then we can come back and um, again, use that valuable information and um, make any revisions necessary to uh, your existing ordinance. I'm welcome or I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, um, you know, particularly questions about the enforceability of your existing ordinance. Um, one point I would like to make, uh, Tom mentioned, um, you know, the extent to which your, um, Julia as the public health officer um, has statutory authority to issue orders and to enforce those orders. She still has that statutory authority. Um, the Palm case did not impact her capability of doing orders or enforcing those orders. That we know. The question becomes the extent to which the enforcement mechanisms are appropriate in your ordinance. Um, but for simplicity's sake, know that your public health officer still has her statutory authority to issue orders and enforce those orders. Any changes to your ordinance will be to ensure that the enforcement mechanisms comply with the current state of the law. Mr. Van Etten, do you have anything you wish to add? I do not. Mr. Hoff. Yeah, so in summary, um, you know, we, we put this together uh, to help clarify what is in the ordinance. Um, you know, since we started working on this, uh, WCA, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, decided that it is important enough that they're going to take a, a deeper dive into it and, and a further look and come up with some recommendations that may affect, um, you know, the, the layout of the ordinance that's before you now. So we wanted to at least get it in front of you just to kind of put the thought in your head that that's the direction that we're going. Uh, we're proceeding with that. We'll, we'll listen to WCA's advice and then come back uh, with any changes uh, probably next month or, or two months anyway. Well, I have a list of concerns, but in the in interest of brevity, I would ask, I would entertain a motion to table this until uh, probably to the August meeting, August public safety meeting. I'll make that motion. I have a motion from Mr. Buckholtz. I have a second from Mr. Dennis. In discussion, any discussion on the motion to table? Is this at all time sensitive, Tom? Uh, not necessarily, no. I mean, well, if, if we get something uh, by July, we'll, I mean, we can bring it forward, but uh, I, I don't know the timetable on this uh, study group and what they're going to come back with time-wise. I think we need to be very careful if we're going to start changing up some of these statutory requirements. We've got a lot of people who are really kind of frustrated with some of these things that are coming through there and clarifying the chains of authority. Palm is a member of the executive branch. The authority that is being exercised by Health and Human Services is a legislative issue. And that's, those are separate things that are being conflated. And I don't think that we're in a position right now to debate that because I think that um, goes to a higher power than what the board has been delegated with. So um, any more discussion on this motion to table until August public safety? Calling for a vote, all in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, motion carries. All right, moving on to number 10, school bus safety discussion. So here I'm gonna help kind of 
address this in a streamlined fashion. Um, this is the end of the school year for a lot of schools that were that are impacted by this COVID-19. And so it was going to be difficult to get anybody to come in because of social distancing and their own issues that they have with trying to do virtual graduations and whatnot. And so I talked to Mr. Hoff about this and we're, I'm of two minds. One is we need to address this public safety, this, this, the school bus safety issue. And there's a couple of different um, issues that arise from this. One is the chargeability of, of an offense that the sheriff's department and law enforcement has to deal with. And the second is re acknowledging and trying to alleviate the pressure that's on bus drivers to not only ensure the safety of the students coming on and off, but also the, the surrounding areas. And then they're also putting, I think is an almost an unfair burden of being the reporting officer on something that happened. So they have to get identification of the person you know, who allegedly violates the law while also trying to save the student. And the student should be the first priority. So we, we need to figure that out. So my recommendation, and Mr. Hoff is going to clarify what this is, is I either wanted to form a task force to get some people from the community to involved with, to, tr to try to address this, when I say community, it would be uh, members from law enforcement, from the busing companies, from the school districts, and then other concerned citizens that would come in and then develop a plan to either identify where the hotspots are and then try to get law enforcement to adjust their patrols. And then a second part of that would be to deal with this is in, in passing an ordinance, not a statutory requirement, but an ordinance that allows for um, a little bit more flexibility in terms of charging out any kind of violations that arise to that so that it's more responsive because the, the statute has a very limited time for when a, a citation can be issued and then presented to the district attorney for a charging document. So I think that creates a lot of frustration and it puts an unfair burden on law enforcement. And I already think that we have already overburdened law enforcement with charging, with protecting just about everything that happens outside and uh, we need to do something that alleviates that while also ensuring public safety. So Mr. Hoff is going to answer the question about an ad hoc. If the ad hoc committee is something that's too onerous, then I'm inviting Mr. Buckholtz and I, and then any other committee members that want to, we're gonna go drive to these different places and have a discussion and invite this kind of discussion and then come back with a plan to this committee for the next meeting. Mr. Hoff, you have the floor. Yeah, there is a process in the board rules for establishing an ad hoc committee and that that does have to run through the board. And then if you do that, there would be, um, you know, notification and, and open meeting requirements to do that. So it's certainly something that you can do. Um, um, and then as far as the ordinance goes, is Rebecca still on the line? We did have some discussion with legal counsel about what is in our ordinance and, and what uh, is in the statutes and what we could do locally different. Um, Rebecca, do you have any comments on that? Uh, sure. There are um, there are options um, within the statute statutes, and um, I think within your um, your peace and good order ordinance as well, uh, for there to be a charge um, in the event of another incident that similar to what occurred earlier this year in your county. Um, hopefully there's not, but again, um, there are legal options for you if you wish to explore um, charges against the, the driver or other parties involved. Um, Tom is correct in terms of the process um, that your board rules requires for uh, creation of an ad hoc committee. Um, oftentimes, it seems a little duplicative in terms of process to create those committees. Um, mm. But uh, the, those are what your, your board rules requires. Um, I'm happy to go through those if you have more questions as well. So before we do that, I'd like to ask the committee, is there, um, is there a feeling on one way or the other? So we have Mr. Buckle tonight who just found out that he's being volunteered for this probably about three minutes ago. Or do we want to form a committee, an ad hoc committee to do that? I, I'm, I, I want to move on this. This is something that we were working on before the COVID uh, situation happened. And um, I'm a little bit frustrated with some of this, but I want to make sure that we do have some kind of action report for this. So I, I can go either way. Mr. Buckholz. Um, yeah, I'm really concerned about this too as a bus driver because I've had some of these incidents happen and it's very scary. And I know there's more that needs to be done. So I would be fine 
Mr. Bennett, are you still with us? I am. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, okay. I'm not uh, familiar with what we're talking about. Was it an incident on a bus or an incident that involved a bus? It, it, it's an incident that involved a student that was boarding the bus, but we've had multiple incidences and uh, one of our community members came in to address an incident that happened with her family in January. We had another incident that happened in March that was the second incident resulted in charges being filed and that's still pending and that's still pending adjudication. And so there was a concern from the community that asked to address this and Mr. Buckholtz who in his other life is a bus driver um, brought some issues to the, to the board, to the committee that we wanted to address. And so we had some, the previous public safety committee uh, had a public discussion on this. We had members from the school districts coming in and talking about it. We had other representatives from the busing companies. And then we had um, the other law enforcement agencies represented who also spoke to it. And there was a few things that came from that discussion. One was, this is a prevalent issue. Second is the charging of a document is very strict. And um, there's a lot of things that happen in place there in order for a, a successful charging document to be advanced from the DA against the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator. And because of that, that creates, and uh, it, it's very difficult to have that come forward. And so there's an unfair assignment of, of blame or responsibility that's placed on the different segments, whether it's the busing company, law enforcement, the school district, or the parents. And so we're trying to figure out a way to address, bring awareness to this and um, acknowledge and try to alleviate the pressure for the companies and providing the safety and then, you know, assuring the public that we're going to, that we don't have to worry about children getting on the, on the bus to go to, to go to school. So we had those discussions and then it kind of stopped because of the COVID uh, situation. Now we're trying to resurrect that and school's out of session. So um, what's, what's on the table right now is Mr. Buckholtz and myself would make arrangements to go talk to the various groups to um, kind of get information as to what we can do for a, a potential plan of action that I'd like to bring back for the next, next, next public safety meeting and then advance that to the full board. Or more publicly, probably a little more expensive, is a ad hoc committee that has formal um, authority to kind of convene kind of an action and then develop an action plan um, it's a little bit more bureaucratic and it might be take a little bit longer, but you know, I want to make sure that everyone has a full opportunity to participate. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Do you have any comments or anything you wish to add? Um, one of my questions, we still have the legal on the line. Um, uh, the way it works from where I'm, uh, by police, um, a school board has authority, um, and charge of students to and from school. So from if a if a child boards a bus, it's still represented by this by the that authority until they get off that bus and get at home. Is or vice versa, when they get on the bus to come to school is the same thing as being in the protection and rules and regulations of the school. Is that true in Wisconsin or is that not true? Ms. Broker? Um no, I think that that generalized rule would not pl apply in Wisconsin. Um, there, between you know whether it is a private bus company that is retained by a district or um, you know busing facilities that are um, owned by a district, there can be um, different arrangements in terms of the responsibility for students when they're on the bus. So, and those. Um, those vary um, between circumstances and facts and, um, you know, each situation being somewhat unique. So I think um, it would be a misnomer to have a generalized rule or a generalized understanding that um, when a child boards a bus, they are within the control of, of the school district. Now, I think um, Supervisor Van Atten makes a very good point that any work the county 
um, does on this issue certainly would include or should include the school districts um, or you know the the private entities and those other stakeholders that you've already started to communicate with um, and given all of the state statutes relating to school districts um, and the interplay um, in the, the DOT statutes and all of the other regulatory statutes on busing, um, you know, those legal components are important to keep in mind when you're working through all of these different issues. Any other questions? So, uh, Mr. Bennett, you got anything else? I do, because with that said, um, I think it's a good idea to, uh, to get with these and when we encompass state statutes and whatnot with county ordinances, um, by getting with the school board and if we can come up with something that the legality is is within the realm of this gray area and do something similar saying that once the the child is on there on the school bus in route or vice versa on the way home that the school has jurisdiction so to speak and us as a county has jurisdiction that we could make an ordinance something to that effect but yes that that's all i got Dennis. Um, i believe the school district in winter does have an ordinance with school board that they are responsible mm -hmm. however it might have changed but i believe they do have that um when i went to school in rapson and husband then that many years ago <laughs> there was a different pickup place um, by Goffins used to be the store and it's a lot safer than where this incident happened in March I mean right on a major major highway um, so maybe school districts need to look at that and it doesn't doesn't help Mrs. Sands because she's on the major highway but for those that are in the village and pertaining to this incident in March I think that could have been avoided. I don't know why that ever changed. Sense. My grandkids no longer get on it. They get on a different location off of Highway 26. This is the second time an incident like that has happened. Anybody also, else? Also, Dennis. I'm not sure about this ad hoc committee. You can't go from an extension on public safety. I don't know. I'm just trying to make sure. Well, I I'm covered. asking. I, that's why I asked too. That's why we have this question. Yeah. Oh. According to the uh, according to your board rules, I believe the ad hoc committee. Uh, if you wanted to form an ad hoc committee, uh, the chair recommends uh, the ad hoc committee and appoints the members with the approval of the full board. Um, after establishing uh, the mission of an ad hoc committee. So there is no provision for uh, a committee to establish an ad hoc committee is my understanding of the board rules, the way they're written. So it would have to have to happen at the board level right. under the direction of the chair. Mr. Schumann. Very important issue here. Um, I really appreciate your attention and your plan going forward with looking into this. I think it would fall under the jurisdiction of this committee. We've already looked at it. What I would do, Mr. Chairman, is just keep it front and center on top of your agenda and stay on it. Invite the school board, bus company, all those people. Find out where the safest pickups are. What are the hot spots, like you mentioned? And I would continue to look at it right here. You got very good people right here. Mr. Chair. Mr. Buckholz. Um, when I start my school year um, to pick up kids, I, I run my route. I go out, I find out where everybody lives. And my other next job on that school bus is this pickup area safe for these children. If it is not safe for these children, I bring it back to the transportation supervisor and tell them, no, nope, I can't pick these up. We need to work with that parent to pick them up at a safer location. Uh, but that's just how Indian has worked. So, and that's what I drive for it but it's gotta be a safe location and I make that decision. And I just recommend it to my supervisor. So. Any other comments? Uh, Rebecca had a, a comment. Rebecca, are you on the line? I am. Um, with respect to the formation of an ad hoc committee, um, 
yes, indeed, it originates at the board level um, with the chair making that recommendation, um, making the recommendation of the members um, and then approval by the board. Then, however, it does come back to a committee of jurisdiction, which in this, in in this instance would be public safety um, for final creation. So there is a provision in your board rules that keeps a connection between an ad hoc committee and a committee of jurisdiction. So the only reason I put this out there is because I wanted to make sure that we had lawful authority of this conversation but I also don't want to create more process in creating an ad hoc committee to go look at this problem when I think a couple of phone calls and a couple of meetings we could have with this with a plan of action in July, which is going to take us that long to form the committee in the first place. So I'm not trying to exclude people. I'm trying to expedite this so that we could have something in place that the school districts, the busing companies and all that have a chance to have it in place when school starts in the fall, if we do have school and if people do go to school. Ms. Dennis. Um, I think it's also possible. I think it's going to be difficult to get school board, the school board here for a meeting. Is it not possible to attend their meeting? Um, both incidents have happened in the winter school district. Not saying this can't happen in another district, but right now there's issues there. So I think if, if we attend their meeting, you're going to get a bigger response. Um, more suggestions, more help. Right. So I'm just, that's, that's my plan of action. Uh, just asking for recommendations If there's, if this committee wants me to, to go through the steps of forming an ad hoc, then I'll definitely do all the steps that's there. Otherwise, me and Mr. Buckles will do a tour of Surrey County because it's, we have two incidences that are of high profile in winter, but LCO and Hayward have also talked about incidences that haven't been able to be addressed. And so I want to try to address this in a, in a timely fashion without making this all about pomp and circumstance. <coughs> if we get this conversation and, and get it done, I think we've got enough of uh, bureaucracy and policies and legal interpretations. So is there anything else? Is there a recommendation or a motion that the board would entertain? Otherwise, me and Mr. Buckholz will do it. And if I go out, I, I don't know if I have Mr. Schleter's number. I do have Mr. Van Etten's number. I'll text you. If you guys want to come with me, you can. If not, that's fine. And I'll just report back in July. If you have three, that's a quorum. I'd have to go in a second. Two of you could go. The best argument against democracy is five minute conversation with a voter. I'm telling you. That's not enough against you, but. Any questions, comments? Well, maybe we want to go with that. Mr. Slater? I'll do whatever the committee wants to do. Why well, can't we agree with Dale on that? That way we can get a hold of like we did before Hurricane, LCO, Winter, um, Hayward, anybody within the school districts here to come to this special meeting. I guess that would be a good way to go. Um, and we just got to make them aware that it's very important that they attend this meeting. Senator Rapinski. Yeah, I had on to the school district uh, with our community for the children. All right, I'll put this to the committee, entertain a motion on whatever direction that we, we should do to, to address this. Ms. Dennis. I'll make a motion that we hold a special meeting and invite this <coughs> involved besides plus community members, such as parents, grandparents that are concerned. I have a motion by Ms. Dennis. I'll second. I have a second by Mr. Buckholz. In discussion, so we'll, what we're asking for is a special meeting of the Public Safety Committee with one agenda item to discuss school bus safety with a plan and possible action with an invitation to be sent to the school districts, the busing companies, law enforcement, and uh, community at large. Any other discussion? 
Mr. Schluter. I will definitely do a drive through to make sure that everyone has a chance to participate. Um, Mr. Buckholz can come with me and then yeah. don't anybody call me so I don't have to report it to open open records. <laughs> Just kidding. Do I have to set a date or? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm wondering if we should do it on a day when there's an old court because if we get a big crew, we might want to use the court. That's just a suggestion. I agree. So, can we? So, the motion is for a meeting, a uh, special meeting with all the parties invited. Um, I think um, I would ask that the motion remain as it's stated and that um, I will coordinate with Mr. Ha and then um, with, Ms., uh, with, with Madam Clerk here to send out the invitation so that we can coordinate with public health safety regulations, sp meeting space areas, and then come back with a date that we can publicize and give everyone a chance to participate. Any other discussion on the motion? Yeah. Hearing no other discussion, all in favor of the motion for a special meeting for public school bus safety indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right, moving on now to the clerk of courts report. Madam Clerk, the floor is yours. Any questions regarding the report that was submitted to the committee from the clerk of courts? Hearing no discussions, thank you, Madam Clerk. Do you have anything else you wish to add to your report? All right, thank you for coming. You. Sheriff's Department. Sheriff, you're on, you're on deck, or you're, you got the floor. As we know, it's been a busy couple months with the COVID issue. And we have concerns regarding COVID. But the month of May has been exceptionally busy for us as well. We had our fourth vehicle crash, fatality crash in Sawyer County. And uh, several days later, we dealt with the homicide, the potential homicide. And several days after that, we dealt with the dam failure on uh, the Mosquito Brook Village there, Mosquito Brook Road and Portman's Road, the two roads. That, uh, we dealt with a lot of damage and road issues of concern then. We're, we're currently concerned, and uh, with the civil unrest we're facing, what, what started in the Twin Cities area has spread across the nation and even beyond. Southern Wisconsin is facing some major disruption. And uh, we received intel and, and Lieutenant Lipinski here extended that as well. And there's a lot of concern about it going into the rural areas and especially the tax on law enforcement, their homes and families as well. So there's been concerns with that. Locally here, we did deal with the night before last the, uh, the Memorial Cross in Clouray, uh, Mike Billiard's Cross. They uh, set it on fire with the solvents. Um, thanks to the RDMS crew, there were several of them that went out and uh, did a great job of uh, doing their best job possible to uh, reestablish an existing face like one. But uh, we, we did put a press release out and we're hoping to receive information as far as who did the damage and deal with it appropriately. It's one thing to protest, but to riot and loot is unaccepted, unaccepted, unacceptable as well. And uh, we will, uh, when it comes to criminal damage to property or harming people, we will pursue that. To, all the briefs that forwarded to the district attorney for charges. And I just want to mention and, and thanks Mr. Chairman for acknowledging Deputy Richard Welch. Dick was a great member of our agency, a very caring, compassionate, sensitive man with excellent work ethic. With that, he was not only a great person, but a great mentor. And uh, he leaves a huge void in our agency. So I have a uh, the dispatch report in front of me. Um, the calls for the month of May, even though know, um, we had kind of a busy month, the, the actual call volume uh, decreased quite a bit actually. So, uh, May 11th, 
uh, they did some tornado siren testing, maybe pet can help out with this one a little bit. It sounds like all the sirens are operable, but they just can't get them to operate the way they were intended to operate. Well, there were some issues with the gateway catching some abnormal radio numbers. Um, they redid some retesting and the sirens did set off, so they do have a way to set them off now. Um, but they're working on this with take, getting everybody together in the right page in dispatch to do it. With the equipment and everything. But they set off. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, that's all I have. Thank you, Johnson. Um, so if there's any questions on my mid jail report, uh, feel free to ask. I will, I guess, point out that you know the last couple months we've seen the sentence inmate to uh, sentence inmate incarceration numbers have gone up compared to where they normally are. Typically, probation, pre sentence, and sentence inmates is all about a third each. Uh, but that's due to the prisons not accepting new intakes because of uh, all the COVID precautions. Um, the good news on that end is that as of this week, prisons have now started accepting a uh, limited number of inmates, but they're doing a pretty good job thus far while spreading that all across the state. Um, so we do have some people that haven't gotten on yet this week. How many position openings is the jail? I mean, what's your staff? Are you up or down? Or? We are down three full time positions. I, I just want to add, too, it, it was learned with our uh, monthly probation meeting here that the state DOC secretary is looking at sanctioning probation violations rather than revoking them, which instead of going to prison, we will end up holding them. Oh, shit, okay. Take back my phone. I thought we were going to do a sanction where they can, all right, forget it. Anything else, Mr. Jar Lieutenant? No. Anything else from the report, Mr. Chairman? Just okay. the numbers are slightly up as people get out and move about again. As the sun lights start to get back to reality, uh, call volumes are going to slowly climb back up to their probably normal from what they were for the last few months. Any questions for the Sheriff's Department, Mr. Van Etten? I do not. Thank you. Dennis? I would just like to thank you for all that you've done and you do. And please be safe as much as you can. We appreciate it. Thank you. We do. Keep up the good work and just be safe. No need to this. Mr. Hoff? Yeah, I, I'm just going to echo the same thing uh, Ms. Dennis said. Uh, you know, we deal with all the departments uh, within the county and uh, it's been a crazy crazy time uh, in 2020 here uh, dealing with everything that we've had to deal with and the immense pressure on the sheriff's department uh, in particular um, you know i know they feel it um, and we appreciate the efforts and uh, ems staff too it's it's uh, been a crazy time and and i know these guys and gals are under immense pressure and we appreciate your efforts thank you So we have the animal control report. Is Sherry on the line or? Do you have any questions regarding the animal control report other than the fact that we missed her for not being at the team? All right, moving on to emergency management department report, Ms. Sanchez. I have three words. I hate COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have your report, my report in front of you if there's any questions. Any questions for Ms. Sanchez? Mr. Bennett, do you have any questions for uh, Ms. Sanchez? I do not, thank you. Communication specialist report, do you have that report in front of you as well? Any questions regarding our radios or whatever else? Mr. Bennett, do you have any questions for the communicationist, the communication specialist report? I do not. All right, we have the coroner's report. Coroner's not present. Anybody have any questions regarding the coroner's report? 
Menon Ambulance Service Department. Mr. Dunstan. Um, so just like Todd said, um, we're all sick with COVID. COVID's really kind of trumpled us down quite a bit, but now we started to kind of deal with this as our normal. So we're starting to kind of get caught up on some of that stuff. Um, with that, of course, our call volume had been down. Uh, patients aren't going to ER. You know, they're holding off. I know the coroner talked about it in morning briefings with Julia. So we're starting to maybe see a little bit younger deaths that are happening because people are not going to get the treatment. Um, besides that, um, with protesting too, um, we're seeing it. Uh, we have uh, things that have come out from the state for, you know, hey, be advised if you're going to the Twin Cities, you might not really reconsider that. So we do bring a lot of patients all over the place. Um, and I think they were doing that again in Duluth. So I think they were going to try to block the bridge, is what I was last told this morning. Um, staff wise, we hired six part time employees, um, which quite a few of them are going to really help the uh, Round Lake area. So we're pretty excited about that. They live out there. Um, and then we did hire three more paramedics who hopefully be able to back them and help us for trip. Um, and then with the COVID pandemic, we did uh, successfully transport a, uh, a positive case of COVID with all precautions and, and no incidents and so on. So other than that, I don't really have much. Any questions for Mr. Dunstan? I just have one. Mr. Hey. Buckles. How come it took so long after they blacked out that the, the ambulance and the cars can drive on it? It over a week and a half. That was for the, the steering, steering process. Um, that's what we were told for the warranty. Really? At the ambulance station or just some highway in general? No, at the ambulance station. I mean, they were parked over there at the um, Ojibwe Town Hall, and then a couple of times I see them parked across the road. And I don't know, that just don't seem right that you'd have to wait that long before you can drive one. I mean, it's, it's just normal blacktop. Yeah, we're, it's not a contractor. And we're still having some issues with the curing because they're still kind of, I don't know, with the surface or whatever, because it's been so hot. No, so yeah. they, they're saying it's like six months to actually make it hard. So turning sharp and all that kind of stuff is having some hell out there. Better get under warranty. Who put it in there? Any other questions for Mr. Dunstan? I'm sure. Mr. Schumann. Um, have you been watching your 2020 budget, Nate? Yeah. And where are we at with that as far as your revenue stream, coding and billing? Yeah. I guess I'd like to hear your comment. Um, you can kind of help me with it. But we did just have our first initial budgeting meeting for 2021. Um, it sounded like to me because we were kind of budgeting low, uh, from what Mike Keith had said for like our, our projected for 2020. Um, as long as we kind of set a term, we should be okay. So the, the other thing is too, is we don't make money on 911 calls. So our 911 calls have been down. We're not using a lot of like maintenance costs on the truck. So we normally make more of our money back on our facility, as you know. Um, so it's kind of even itself out a little bit. Would you? Yeah, on the on the revenue side, obviously, uh, I think we uh, budgeted conserv conservatively, and uh, good thing because uh, with the COVID stuff, that uh, the revenue is steady but not uh, not over the top. So, um, as Nate said, we've met with every department director. Um, not only talking about the 2020 budget, but already on the 2021 budget um, because of all the uh, added expenses with COVID and, and whatnot. And so it's it's gonna be a challenge all the way around, but uh, ambulance so far is holding its own. Um, and if I can help that too, um, on the payroll side, of course the ambulance payroll is our biggest um, We have decided, so we internally um, promoted two paramedics that were in advanced EMT positions. Um, Haley and John Blakeman. Um, we are decided to just fill those with part time stuff to cut off benefits to try to help you. Mr. Bennett, do you have any questions for Mr. Dunstan? Yeah, uh, real quick on the trans 
report of the confirmed COVID-19 patient, how far was the, the transport? Uh, they went down to Marshfield, Maine. It was the only uh, uh, place that would accept the patient. So what, what is that, I, I, approximately like 50 miles an hour, two hours? Uh, two, around two. Two uh, hours. A little bit over two hours, yeah. And, and my next question, uh, with that in mind, um, I, I'm not understanding, are, are, I don't know if this falls under our area or if this is something different, but is the, is the uh, veterans van transporting veterans again, or is that not happening? That, I don't know if that's-, that's Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett, and I think that's better question either directed at Mr. Schumann or Mr. Hoff. Okay, well, that, that was my question with the, I, I get the transportation, but it's probably a different department. That's why I wanted clarification. And I don't okay. know if this, is that something we do at the regular meeting? You probably asked that question better at the full board meeting, or I think admin is next Thursday at 10 o'clock if you wanted to come to that meeting. That's okay, the, thank you. Service officer yeah. reports. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Dunstan? Uh, I guess I just have one last. Nate, how are we doing with the transfers out of Hayward Hospital? Are we were sharing them with another company every other call or whatever? Have you made any progress on that? Uh, we have not um, because of COVID just swamping the hurting too. Um, we're trying to get in there and you know they're trying to redo all their processes and everything else. Um, but that's still in my docket to talk with them. Uh, they just recently again switched out their medical director for the ER. Um, so I'm hoping to do that. I know we've been busier to the south. Uh, Ray Slake has been having some staffing issues lately. Uh, we've picked up some of theirs. Um, and then Lady Smith is still first call for us. Any other questions for Mr. Dunstan? All right, moving on. Uh, next item of discussion is the date and time of the public safety meeting. A little bit of background. Uh, a couple years ago, this meeting used to be held on Tuesday mornings at 8.30 that was moved to accommodate for uh, the judge, the clerk, the DA because of the intake. So we moved to Thursday mornings at 8.30 and advanced it up one week. Um, now that we have a new committee, um, new, new board, new committee, it's been asked to reconsider the date and time of this meeting. A couple of factors that we need to take into consideration before we put this to discussion and a vote is <clears throat> the, the employees of the county have one week where they call committee week and that's where all the different departments prepare reports and then Mr. Hoff then attends along with Ms. Williamson in her position as the county clerk to advise and allow for the county board to have its oversight responsibilities. And they usually do that in during a one week period. When we move the public safety out of the Tuesday slot to the Thursday, we put that one, we put that the Thursday prior to committee week. And so I just want you to be aware of that. If we do any movement about this, changing it one way or the other, we need to make sure that we're, we're conscious of the fact that we have uh, hourly employees that will be reporting to a committee either during a work day or if we do this in the evening, putting them in an overtime situation where they're coming in after hours. We also have to make sure that we accommodate for everyone's schedule, but we also need to make sure that everyone has a chance to participate. We all were elected to this. We don't have control over where the meetings are. We have very limited access to having these meetings. And so if we take this under consideration, I want all those factors to at least be on the table without really pressuring one person or another. So with that being said, um, I'll open the floor up for discussion from the committee members on this. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Buck Holtz. We need to leave it right where it's at. Okay. Any other comment? Mr. Bennett, do you have anything you wish to add? Yes, I, I have an issue with uh, having a full time job working, and mornings are, are my worst. Afternoons would be better. I understand that evenings aren't going to work and I get the overtime situation, um, but from five o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock is my busiest time. And so this is very difficult to manage on my end, but I get if I'm the only one and 
<laughs> as as uh, when I'm on mute, it's not so bad. I'm I'm multitasking and have all this stuff going on. But once the COVID-19 uh, and we're actually going to be in, and it's not going to be a Zoom anymore. I'm not going to be able to attend these these meetings in the morning. Any other comments, Mr. Schleter? Uh, we decided that as the COVID-19 is over, that we're not going to allow for virtual acceptance. I don't know what that would be. That's I think in your board rules, you allow uh, one or two virtual attendance. I mean, you can change your board rules if, I mean, we're under new <laughs> world. Yeah, so I mean, you, you could allow it if you wanted to, it would require a change to the board rules to do that. Showing that there are some positives with the virtual meetings. We did amend our board rules to accommodate this, especially during the state of emergency. But then even after the state of emergency, we're allowing about two to three. Is it three? So I think it's three meetings they can call in, but we could certainly address that, especially for a case like Mr. Van Etten. I, I really like him on this committee, and I think he adds a lot to it. So. Um, like him attending virtually like this, if this works, we should address that. Well, I think it's difficult. If we're gonna, if we're going to, re, you know, hold someone accountable, and and they they are unable to meet that, that's a that's a that's a very difficult request. I mean, when you run for office, I know that there's certain restrictions that we take when we come on board, but we have to be somewhat, we have to be flexible. We have to show some kind of consideration. I mean, he has a job. He has a he has provide. You know, he's probably the sole, maybe the provides for his family. I don't want to diminish that and, and say that. Well, he needs to take one day out of the month and, and make himself available because we all do that. And then it's more than more than that because when we take this responsibility, we have a public public acknowledgement of what we're doing, and we got to be fully informed. And you get fully informed by participating in these meetings and giving him an opportunity to participate. I think it's something that needs to be needs to be respected. So I get that we have comfort, we have levels and, you know, I will say that my schedule, I'm lucky that I have an employer that provides me the flexibility to participate. So whatever we decide, I will make that happen and, and make the necessary combination. Mr. Slater? I'm definitely in favor of virtual. I think it's hard to to put a, a cap on like if we're saying three meetings that someone can if they if they use up the three meetings. We're going to make a change that that policy so Mr. Van Etten can do it by virtual. Uh, seeing, I don't know where you would put this in the afternoon because I would be able to do afternoon. I don't know about Ellen. I could do afternoons and I wouldn't have to pay my cup, but it's, you know, I made that commitment. So I'm good. Mr. Ross, do you have anything? Mr. Schumann. Sure, but I could put this on our admin committee agenda and address it there. Address the virtual meeting? Yep. Right. Address that board rule that states that. You good about that? Uh, yeah. That's Mr. Van Etten? Uh, if I could also say something, I I did not, when I put in for the the wish list or what to be on, I had no idea of the times. And my employer, I get five days uh, and I can't just take an hour. I have to take a full day. So those five days under the current, you know, once I, I, I can't make the if we change the virtual thing, I can I can work this in. But if it is going to be an issue, uh, maybe it's possible. Then I can come off this committee and go to a committee that is that meets in the evenings when it's open for me. Not that I want to do that, but I'll put that out there. I, I don't expect anybody to uh, change how they're doing things to accommodate me. But I had no idea when I got assigned this committee that it would be 8:30 in the morning. Sorry about that. I guess that's something that we could put in the board rules so that when 
those lists are put together for that people can make an informed choice as what those are because we have we've been dealing with a lot of incumbents so this is just it's a learning experience any more discussion on the time and day of this meeting what is the earliest time mr van etten could comfortably attend a meeting it, it would be oh um, it's like it's like I, I did this on purpose. I promise you, I didn't. Uh, every time I unmute, the, the phone is ringing. Um, it, it's up until like 10 o'clock when all my meetings stop. I do, I have six counties that I supervise and I have quite a few employees. And so from five o'clock till 10 o'clock, it is just wide open. At least this isn't a Monday or a Friday. So I'm thankful for that. But if we can, you know, do something about the virtual rule, I can I can work that one in. I'm just afraid once the COVID-19 and we are no longer doing virtually, uh, trying to be in place is going to be very difficult. Mr. Hoff, anything else? No. Nothing else? Nothing else on this topic? Okay, we're moving on. Future agenda items. I have one item, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I'd like to bring to your attention, um, and actually the Vice Chair, because you're both here. Um, I think we need to start, we need to put on the agenda some kind of acknowledgement for the essential employees that have been working during this COVID-19, is also acknowledging the other work that's been done. Um, it's just assumed that people are gonna show up and do their jobs, and I think we need to publicly acknowledge the work and the sacrifice that the employees have done, and I. Normally we'd have a cookout, but I don't think anybody, we don't think we got a field big enough to put everyone in one space to give them a rod or a burger or something. But I think we should put this on for a, a point of discussion to figure out some way that we can acknowledge them. I mean, thanking them face to face is always good, but acknowledging their services, you know, we need to do that. I mean, no one stopped to do this. Everyone stepped up and did what they were supposed to do. So that's what I would ask Mr. Mr. Chairman. Anything else for future agenda items? Anything else for correspondence reports for conferences, meetings, or other matters for discussion only? Mr. Van Etten, do you have anything else you wish to address the committee with? Not at this time. Leader? Ms. Dennis? I do. Um, you went through some of the agenda pretty fast. I'd like to say kudos to Pat, also to Tom, dealing with the online meetings, virtual meetings, this COVID thing. Um, you've done a great job. Just wanted to acknowledge that. And you look very tired. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to say it the way it is. Mr. Schumann. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just looking at Marge's group of court report. You know, I should have looked at it while she was here. I would like her and this committee to look at um, financially how it's going to affect the budget when we add the second quarter. Because I see that her uh, revenue's up or something for collecting court costs. Um, I would like her and this committee to look at how are we going to continue to boost our revenue with the second quarter of for scheduling is more efficient. Um, we could pay for option three to the court for court. No, I think by running these court cases more effectively and more efficiently, I think that could bring some revenue. That it's going to make it sustainable or anything, but at least well, we can bounce back a I don't want to get into a quarter discussion about cases either. I mean, that's not, it's not my no, I, a court system. But anyway, anything else for discussion only? Hearing nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.